What's up, everyone? We are officially on tour. So, big thanks to everyone who came out in Chicago this Saturday. Big thanks to Solips and Charles from the Episode 1 podcast for playing with us. The show was a blast. Big love to the city of Big Shoulders. Los Angeles, we will be with you next this Saturday, October 8th, at the Theater at the Ace Hotel. We've got Tim Heidecker. We've got music from L.A. Witch. This show is going to rip. If you are hearing this and live anywhere near Los Angeles, you are contractually obligated to come out. It's going to be a blast. Tickets still available at chapotraphouse.com slash live. And along those lines, we've just been told we've been given a few tickets to do a giveaway for this show. We're going to be doing this giveaway over on Patreon, but it's going to be open to everyone. It will work exactly like our South by Southwest ticket giveaway. I will make a post explaining the rules tomorrow. That's Tuesday morning, Tuesday the 4th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, Then the submissions will be officially opened on Wednesday the 5th, also at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So keep an eye out over on the Patreon and on Twitter if you want some free tickets to the L.A. show on this Wednesday. Uh, After that, we're still coming to NYC on Friday the 14th with music from 95 Bulls and our stand-up opener that we can't name. Then to Miami, I mean, uh, to Fort Lauderdale on Sunday the 30th with music from Don Z and the same stand-up opener. Links to all tickets over on chapotraphouse.com slash live. Now, on with the show. You can get you can get liver and onions, the Charlie Chaplin. Oh okay. yeah, it's not like, yeah. Um, no, no, you get, kidney, you get lobster kidney. thermidor. It's a kidney and onions. Kidney and onions. Okay, yeah. well, what's what's lobster thermidor as opposed to like regular lobster? Okay, so okay. this is a classic. Uh, uh, this is the kind of fish was like the height of fanciness you know, about a hundred years ago before we discovered you know uh, modern cuisine as such. It's one of those before you could dip dishes, lobster in melted butter. You don't, mm. yeah, before, it, it, you don't see it so much anymore. So you take a lot. It's essentially twice baked lobster. You take a lobster, you, you boil it, it half. up, you cut it in half sideways, mm-hmm. you take out the meat, you toss it with sherry and, and uh, cheese, I think, or something, and then you make it into kind of basically like a, a, a souffle type thing, and then you stuff it into back into the shell, and then you cook it again, and then, yeah, it's delicious. Okay. Okay. I can deal with that. Ugh. We're we're talking about an executive the lunch. Uh, yeah, oh, those uh, the ice cream sandwiches are so good though. Those, those are, are great. Oh, hello. Okay. Oh, hello. All right. Hey, it's Chapo. All right. Chapo coming at you. Star date unknown. Recording undisclosed location. Matt Felix, we've got movie sign. Yeah. If you were hearing this, we have passed away. <laughs> yes. This is the last episode you will ever hear. We are speaking from the beyond the grave. Yeah. This is a message. This is a message from the future. Someday during the October tour, we foolishly all got on the same plane. <laughs> it was hit by a, a Texas Air National Guard anti-air battery while flying flying into Austin airspace. Wait a minute. You're aware of this, and yet we're still going to go through with it? This is a message from the future. You are not dreaming. Yeah. This is, you are not dreaming. This is a Chapo movie <laughs> episode. Well, I to explain, I've jacked off into a cup, and <laughs> I've given instructions to 10 women I know uh, with the best genetics and told them to, you know, make a kid. And I've taken out a $30 million life insurance policy on myself Ah, for if we get shot down. So I will be giving up my life, but creating a 6'4 son, hopefully, with $30 million. podcast died. It was singing, but, but, okay. But seriously, Peter Berg will be executed. (laughs) (laughs) That is correct. That is correct, Felix. The movie we are bringing you is the second in the Peter Berg series, which years ago began with the classic film, one of my favorite Chopper episodes, Patriot's Day, the Boston bombing movie. Yep. The episode that involved me accidentally taking a 100 milligram edible and being in a movie theater when Kevin Bacon started talking to us, the real actual Kevin Bacon in the movie theater. Uh, Patriot's Day, one of my favorite Chopper movie episodes. We'll see how this one goes. The movie we're bringing you is a movie that offered... The America of 2012, a glimpse at an alternate universe, an alter, a, 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 a scenario that might have been, where rather than the mega comic book cinematic universes that we are 
uh, so that, that, that dominate today's popular culture landscape, we could have had a board game based cinematic universe, perhaps with competing Hasbro Cinematic Universe, Parker Brothers Cinematic Universe, M- Milton Bradley, or, uh, and of course all of the the, uh, the smaller studios and independents that would get all of those public domain games like chess and checkers, Go, and cheesy, yes, the classic game of the, Go. the ancient Chinese game of Go. Yeah, no, the movie is Battleship. Battleship. Peter Berg's Battleship, a Hasbro film. Yes. So during the Bush era uh, and the El Bungler, that that period, that is when we went from having the classic Hollywood uh, understanding where there would be a bunch of movies that would come out and you'd throw stuff at a wall and you see what's stuck and you just sort of do that every year. But because of the changing economics of film, during this period, the like second Bush term to a bungler, uh, Hollywood starts going around for a new business model to deal with their new reality. And it, and that one requires radically increasing the size of movie budgets while reducing the risk associated with any specific film. And that meant intellectual property. And that meant specifically intellectual property owned by the studio. So where is it going to come from? Where in the big bin of stuff people have heard of, are we going to go? And there were three big options. One was toys, and the big exponent of that we got was Transformers, of course. Michael Bay's Iraq War, basically. Uh, (laughs) He spent about as much time and about as much money trying to get America to care about the Transformers and to make it like a cultural thing, and it never happened, and it was a a huge disaster. So that, that was his Iraq War. Uh, but it, other than like those movies and like the GI Joe movies, which are only kind of yeah, more, barely the, barely hit. Yeah, yeah. There was no real. It didn't get a, a, a gusher. Then of course we've got uh, comic books, which well, I mean that it, exploded. Iron but, Man came out in two thousand eight, so yeah. the Marvel Cinematic Universe is already forty years into into yeah. Project A or whatever the fuck they were calling that shit back yeah. then. Um, but yeah. This this was this was this they started at, they were casting about they were like, casting about okay, what, what else is do, what are there other than comic books yeah comic books and like old like cartoon shows and stuff and the answer board games mm-hmm. um, speaking of budgets I'm just looking at the uh, Wikipedia for Battleship it says your Battleship was greenlit with a production budget of 150 million Ooh. but went through a troubled pre production Universal at one point considered canceling the film which it, which would have resulted in a 30 million dollar loss however. New chairman Adam Fogelson decided the studio would lose less money if they increased the budget of the film instead of outright Absolutely. canceling it. Absolutely. Step yep. on the fucking gas. Jared, yes. Jared, Jared Fogelson coming in <laughs> clutch. Um, so, yeah, this, this movie, um, it product of great waste. If we had just spent three times the budget of this movie, we could refill the missiles in the Iron Dome. <laughs> um, but this was... How do I, you know, just short glance, how do I describe this movie, um, uh, Leonard Maltin style? This is a movie for people with no internal monologue and no memory of events uh, more than a minute past them. <laughs> this is, um, you know. This is all of Oliver Sacks' patience and awakenings. That's This is yes. the movie for them. We watch a lot of bad movies for this for this show. We watch a lot of mediocre things. We will watch a lot of, like, good things. Um, it's very rare that a thing we watch makes me severely depressed. The last time it happened was when we watched the Warcraft movie, which I think was, I think is made for like, um, I guess middle class children in, in in China who just Adderall's not working for them. I supposed kn- to watch the uh, Warcraft movie, and this is worse than that. I this honestly, I, he t- he talked, he said that earlier. He said this reminds me of the Warcraft movie, and I had a moment where I thought, have I seen that? And then I remembered, no, we did an episode about yeah, it. Yeah, Branson, Branson was on Branson. it. Branson. I'm pretty sure I found that episode. So that means I saw it, but I swear to God, I remember nothing about it. I don't remember anything except waking up in a clock tower with a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess my, my Sandy Kenyon style review of Battleship is, um, run, don't walk to see Battleship. It's the movie that'll make you forgive the Japanese for attacking Pearl Harbor. That is a lot of the subtext of this movie. That's <laughs> yeah. probably the most interesting thing about this movie, the yeah. Pearl Harbor connections. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this movie really makes more sense as like a veiled movie about Japan and the United States allying against China. Because we'll talk about it. The aliens in this movie are ba- they, there's even though they're supposed they are able to travel interstellar dimensional space, the, their tech, uh, their their 
physiognomy. They're basically humans, only slightly yeah. different. Yeah. It's they basically, it's basically the way Asian people were viewed in films until like five minutes ago. You know, like you could see that as sort of uh, the, the subtext here because the, it's not really, they aren't aliens. They're, a, they're just people with right. like weird gecko eyes. And I, I would even, I would extend that analogy, the China analogy, if it's definitely how Peter Berg sees it, to the alien technology, very similar to a TCL TV where you know you get it and you're like oh my god this is like a great alien battleship i'm getting an entire 60 inch tv for 370 (laughs) dollars and it's got roku built in four years later you try to load up hbo max and it just your tv turns off and the the woman's yelling at you (laughs) because you brought your tv i want to watch euphoria felix yeah Yeah. you brought your tv to her house because you said (laughs) i have i have euphoria on my tv and she's like I'm I'm rushing a sorority at UCLA. I was born I was born in uh, in 2002. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, um, well, I'm actually going to be a director soon. Um, and then she's like, why does your how come you have a four year old TCL TV that doesn't work? <laughs> and I say, well, it's a lot like Peter Berg's Battleship. <laughs> and she says that came out when I was ten years old. <laughs> This is a real thing that happened. This is I do the. This well, is exactly what I do in my life. At one point, Felix, you said this, this movie sounds like it was written by a Chinese television. It may, in fact, have been. Uh, Matt, a little bit earlier, uh, you said the magic word aliens. Yes. Now here is I mean, it's like the problem for for Universal and studios casting about for like uh, something to compete with the Star Wars and Marvel mega franchises, um, and, and and happening upon board games is essentially how do you make a board game as mind-numbingly boring and childish as Battleship into a fun, exciting action movie? A right. uh, quick side note for uh, listeners of the show. The last time I played Battleship was actually losing to Ian Fidance. Whoa. <laughs> yes. that, was, that was the last time I played Battleship. But um, obviously, Ian, very funny guy, but the game was interminable. <laughs> how do you make this into a dynamic, exciting motion picture? Well, the answer is aliens. Yeah. And... You know, like uh, the, 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 we we could have said like the, the studio could have, studios could have taken this in a lot of different directions, like uh, the game of Operation, make it a movie about yeah, like uh, humans getting abducted and uh, operated on by aliens. Oh, I was thinking like a John Q type movie. <laughs> <laughs> you you Do killed you my son like- because you tried to have a wacky surgery. <laughs> <laughs> you took my son's money bone out. And you killed him. <laughs> Okay, you, how about this? You could do a jo- you could do a uh, saw style horror movie too. Ooh, yeah. Waking up on the operation table, uh, uh, you got to like operate on yourself with a machine or something. Okay, how about this one? Hungry, hungry hippos. The aliens arrive on Earth in giant battle mechs, like sort of Evangelions, Avas, but they're hippo shaped, yep. and they just chomp up cities, and they yep. have to stop the hippos from being hungry. Right. I think we all, unfortunately, before this episode even started, when we knew this is the episode we were going to do. We all basically arrived at the same joke about the life board game movie. <laughs> Terrence Malick's The Game of Life. You had Terrence Malick. I had David O. Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what did you have? Uh, Alexander Payne. How would that be? <laughs> okay, yeah. Nice and depressing. Yeah. Well, at one point, Ridley Scott was attached to a Monopoly yes, movie. Yes, that is 100% true. That would have been really fucking... Yeah. In, I would have liked that, I think. That thing was in development forever, and I think... I, I think the, uh, Mom, this movie had a lot to do with it dying. Like there, this is why I'm saying we were, there's another universe where this movie succeeded. And honestly, when you look at the shit that does succeed, this is terrible, but it's, it's not, it's no, like this movie is no, no worse, worse than the than shit fucking that people Doctor like. Strange or fucking, uh, no, this movie is a billion times better than the Eternals. Oh, one minute. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This, this is a, a late years better than that movie. I disagree. Really? <laughs> okay. No, I mean, okay. I am on record as like hating those fucking movies the the neo marvel movies like horrible like depress me similarly to the warcraft movie um had a terrible experience watching infinity war <laughs> but um you know nothing in this movie fits together i mean okay we were talking about the board game life you know the stupid way that you view the world when you're a kid where you think like Doonesbury is a special comic strip for adults? <laughs> and it is, it, though. It's in a, it should yeah. be in the editorial section, not the, not the comic it was, section. It wasn't my... Uh, as my grandfather my was told me. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, you know, digression to a digression. I always thought, like, when I'm older, well, I think it's funny that the hats are talking. <laughs> but, like, okay, like, 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 like stuff like that or, like, you know, the board game Life. 
I thought like, oh, I guess that's like what my parents play when they send me to bed. <laughs> Five. Because <laughs> it's just like so complex, I guess. It seemed very boring to me. I never yeah. wanted to play life. But th- this is, you know, even when I was seven playing Battleship, I was like, this is such a... Re- Stupid game. It's very boring. <laughs> yeah. That was just the problem. It's a shitty it's like, game. It's like this game you is boring. Just, you, to play. Just, you, you say a letter and a number, yeah. and then it's either hit or miss. Yeah. And you go through like a while of getting yep. miss, 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 yep. miss, miss. Then you get a hit. Yep. Then you get like then you sink, then it's just like it's a matter of time before you sink a ship. That's it. It's go fish it's with just, artificial. Yeah, exactly. exactly. What exactly. it is is it is literally just a process of elimination. There's no real thought to yes, it. Yes, exactly. There's like no, there are a few. Oh, I'm going to go this just way. Just guessing. Or I'm There's go no that skill way. whatsoever. It's a data entry job <laughs> for children. Yes, yes, that is and exactly it, it, what playing that game feels like. And it's it's a it's like yeah, it's go fish with artificial depth, and the artificial depth is like the fucking bullshit that you have and this movie felt the exact same way yeah, and i th- i think there might be another world where this movie succeeds and if it did then the monopoly movie gets made then we get uh, a clue remake bringing clue back in the film well the ori- i mean the original clue movie is actually, one of the, it's actually, actually, actually a very thing. great movie well that is a board game that i mean more than almost any lends itself to the concept of yeah. the movie it literally is a story that you participate in yeah. but mm-hmm. we could get we'd sorry mousetrap <laughs> we would get all of them, different different genres, different flavors. Diplomacy movie. Yeah. Risk. Be, uh, we would risk. get risk, and it would be yeah. aliens against the Napoleonic army. And you might say, pretty oh, dope. that's ridiculous. No, it's pretty dope. But I'm sorry. It's not any more ridiculous than the army in the, the, the <laughs> our Navy in this movie against aliens. Right. That the is the most shot. absurd thing they about this movie. the same world. chance. It is the most absurd and infuriating thing about this movie that it just gets under my skin as watching is, is that they may, they the, the attempt to make the aliens in any way like the match for of the an humans. interstellar civilization. Well, okay, that, that is defeated by a World War II era battleship. Spoiler at the end of this alert! Movie. Spoiler Ca- alert! Counter argument: the premise is like no more shitty than like any of the existing Marvel movies. I will I, like I. It's exactly as insulting. What is the premise of the Avengers movies? Oh, a uh, uh, purple guy is going to get a, all his jewelry, <laughs> and then he's going to. He's just gonna, you know, solve the agriculture crisis. I guess. I guess that's, you know, that's the plot. That's all these movies have idiotic plots. Doctor Strange is like, oh, a, a, sur- a surgeon um, sat on his hand in a weird way, in a jet and then blue. Jacked himself off. He jacked himself off. It's called the friendly stranger. He did. He got caught in the jet blue bathroom. He didn't book a mosaic ticket and was in the mosaic bathroom. Um, big problem. They won't let him be a doctor anymore. So now he has to be a scary doctor. <laughs> you know, all these movies are stupid and insulting. <laughs> Friendly Doctor Stranger. Yeah, but like this movie, like the way the characters relate to each other, the dialogue, the choices that everyone makes, it is alien. <laughs> this was this was a movie written, produced, and conceived by aliens. This yeah. is I mean, there there is a you know Joss Whedon soyness to Marvel movies, but it's at least something I can put my put my hands on and understand. I cannot understand the things in between aliens and battleships in this movie. Okay, fellas, let's dive in. Yes, let's 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 do, let's play, fellas. Let's play battleship. Let's do it. Let's play battleship. So, uh, the film begins with sort of a uh, a brief preamble setting up the intergalactic stakes of um, this board game slash movie. Um, uh, the movie establishes that something called the Beacon International Project has used a network of satellites to send a signal into deep space to a recently discovered Goldilocks planet. We all know the Goldilocks planet. Of course. A planet that is just just far enough from the sun in its solar system bears. to what? have an atmosphere, oh. gravity, and a temperature roughly comparable to our own planet. Um, and, you know, like, uh, so, so, okay. Done. Established. There are aliens in the movie, so you won't you won't you won't be surprised when they show up later. Uh, they, they have named the planet. It is called Planet G. Planet Planet Top G. G it's unit. The Andrew yeah. Tate planet. Yeah, <laughs> it's the War Room planet. Yeah, yeah, that is. You get a great referral code if you send people that planet. <laughs> uh, what message are we sending into deep space? Uh, uh, Brandy, go to sleep. Ah, ah. and and uh, who want, whom want beer? Yeah. Uh, I'm st- of a nice boy whom st- uh, is a booster and earns st- him cocktails. <laughs> okay, so the intergalactic stakes are established. Then who do we see saddling up at the bar? It's America's heartthrob, Taylor Kitsch. This is the movie that was going to make Taylor Kitsch 
a star. Yeah, he had two bites of the apple. He had this one and John Carter of Mars. Oof, of yeah. Two strikes, you're out, boy. At the end of the day, yes, bad bad luck with the projects, but he just he had the small screen charisma. He zipped, he's like Tom, John Hamm or Tom Jane, guys who are really good on TV shows, but just... They can't carry a movie. I'm sorry. And you know, no, I I actually like Taylor Kitsch quite a bit. I think I think he's good. And you know, obviously Tim Riggins lives in all of our hearts forever. But sorry, Taylor, go back to Dillon, Texas. You'll you'll never get out from under those Friday Night Lights. And by the way, I've seen seeing as how Peter Berg directed this movie, also directed Friday Night Lights. Yes. And produced the TV show Friday Night Lights. The movie also features Jesse Plemons, the lovable goofball Landry is in this movie as well. And basically, Taylor Kitsch and Plemons play exactly their characters from Friday Night Lights. Yeah. It is a very, it's just, a, it's not even a reskinning. They just yeah. put them in different costumes. Yeah. Like, Do you think at like the, the end of Friday Night Lights when they filmed their like last scene together, Taylor Kitsch was like, oh man, I'm going to miss hanging out with Jesse Plemons. But like, you know, I'm headed for the stars and he's just going to be like... You know, he's going to kick around a few shitty movies and end up being killed off mid-season in an HBO series. Um, we're just not even going to be on the same level. I won't be seeing much of him, I guess. And Jesse Plemons has lapped him a thousand times. It's true. It's yeah. brutal. Jesse Plemons has kicked him into the ground and shoveled dirt on his name. He's mar- married Kirsten Dunst. Yeah. Wait, was he nominated for an Oscar for uh, uh, Power of the Dog? No. Okay, yes. Not- oh, he yes. was? Yes. He was? Okay, but, he you know, was. Plem- Plemons has been killing it. Yeah, Plemons, Plemons is, is you know, give, given, Plemons is honestly an avatar of all like slightly to majorly overweight guys who yeah. have much hotter wives and girlfriends. It's, so it's, to him, I doff my cap. I salute you, sir. Absolutely. Taylor Kitsch could not even make it through the entire worst season of True Detective. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. They're like, we gotta get uh, this guy off of here. He's news <laughs> fest. That was one of the worst seasons of prestige TV I've ever seen. And they were still like, Taylor Kitsch, get out of here. You were in Battleship. <laughs> you you were the linchpin of Battleship. So, sort of, you know, uh, a charming bad boy with a heart of gold, Taylor Kitsch, is having a drink at the bar. It's his birthday. He's being toasted by his older brother, the kind of... Um, uh, fly straight, do well, achiever in life. Yeah, uh, a captain. He's a navy captain. He's a navy captain. Played they're, by they're in Pearl Harbor. Yes, play. They're in Hawaii. They're at a bar in Hawaii. He is a navy captain, played by Alexander Sarsgaard, and he's going like, you know, hey, hey, bro, like, I know things are looking down for you now, but like, here, cheers to adversity, bro. Yep, and uh, he's pepping him up, and he's like, got time to time to get straight, and he's like, I don't want to, and he's kind of wavering. What do I do? But then this decision is made for him when 2012's hottest woman on earth, Ooh, oh my God, Decker, Brooklyn Decker, walks in. now for you Zoomers listening, Brooklyn Decker. So there, was, there used to be this position in American culture: the large-breasted, hot blonde. Yep, Jenny and McCarthy, they were, Pam Anderson. Pam Anderson. There was always one, and like the rules would interlap a little bit, but like you could see, it's like a, a passing of the chain. And a Nicole and, Smith. Yes. The last one we had was Kate Upton. They stopped making them after that. The one before Kate Upton, though, was Brooklyn Decker. And then this was her peak. And around this time, she was in this movie. She was in, I believe, a uh, Adam Sandler film. She made a little bad, uh, sc- stab for acting uh, uh, bona fides. It didn't really work. The movies were not successful. She married Andy Roddick. And just went and off, not Justin uh, Verlander, as I as I thought, That's Kate but no, Kate Upton who married had Justin Verlander. The same thing. She yeah. also hottest white woman with big boobs on earth. Had a few movies, didn't do so good. Married a, married an athlete, married a pro athlete. Yes. Yep. Now, th- what were these women used for? Zoomers ask. Well, perhaps this was your dad's wallpaper on his home <laughs> office computer that got him horny enough to create you that one night, <laughs> September two thousand. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um yeah in walks brooklyn decker and taylor kitsch is just like oh bro like you know I, I gotta have her you know and he like saddles up to the bar makes his move um he's trying to impress her she all he wants from the bar is a chicken burrito but she's the hungry closed. she's hungry kitsch she's is hungry. closed sorry so, so taylor kitsch you know uh sort of like uh, like i said rugged bad boy he takes it upon himself he's like you just wait here five minutes I'll get you a chicken burrito. So like runs outside to like the 7-Eleven or whatever. No, some 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 spoof some goose, some jackass style hijinks ensue as he breaks into the 7-Eleven uh, to you know pay for it, but still commit you know unlawful trespass and entry and property destruction um, of of a business. 
he gets her a Seven Eleven, uh, but like he 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 fucks it up. The cops get called. Uh, they chase him back to the bar. They um they tase his ass down and like but like not before he gives her a damn chicken burrito. So this physical comedy scene, um, it, it would it evoke the um, I would say maybe one of the first five movies ever made. That's what I felt like I was watching. <laughs> Yeah. Oof arrives at 7-Eleven. <laughs> That's was <laughs> yeah. I think P- Peter Berg was really just like flexing that uh, silent film comedy muscle. <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, he, he, you know, he's rough around the edges, but he's he's got he's got spunk, charisma, leadership. What needs who who needs that? That's the right, Navy. the Navy. Yeah. So it's like the next morning. He's hung over. His older brothers bailed him out of jail. So he's like, oh, bro, they, they, they tased me, bro. And he's just like, yeah, but they also took you to Burger King because you're damn white. And I should be reminding you your privilege is why you're alive right now. You need to check your privilege and chip up, straighten up, Sit chip out. white ass down and listen. Uh, yeah, sit your white ass down and listen, bro. You're, 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 going to you're the joining Navy. the Navy. Boom. Opening seven time. years okay. later. Battleship. Well, okay, was it seven years it later? It says seven, seven years, years later. later. Okay, yeah. so seven years later. They're back in Hawaii. They've actually never left Hawaii. Like he's, oh, yeah. He's spent his entire career in the Navy in Hawaii. Uh, Taylor Kitsch. Uh, by the way, oh, his older brother's name is Stonehopper. Stonehopper. Captain Stonehopper and, and Lieutenant Le- Le- Alex Hopper. Lieutenant Alex Hopper. Lieutenant Alex Hopper. He is, he is now dating and has been dating for quite, a, quite some time. Brooklyn Deckard, who is the daughter of the Admiral, Admiral Shane, played by Liam Neeson, That's who right. I guarantee you showed up you filmed this movie over a weekend. <laughs> and then he yeah. was like, you got me for 48 hours, like real time, 12 hours set time. Make the most of it. It would be funny if this is the movie that like caused Liam Neeson to have that memory <laughs> about trying to kill a black guy in Ireland. <laughs> Stalking the streets the of 70s. Dublin, yeah. <laughs> looking for a black guy to um, assault uh, because his friend was raped. Yeah, that was, he was basically playing Battleship in real life. <laughs> he was walking Be down free. Rand... Right, he was walking down random streets and he's like, oh, is there a black guy on C3? What about B7? What about C16? And lucky for everyone, you know, he didn't, yeah. he, he lost. Thank goodness. Sad. And I very much enjoy him coming into movies where he's, hello, I'm Liam Neeson, member of the United States Army. I'm sorry, Navy. What is it? What, are, what are farce am I in this? Anyway, I'm an American. That's the thing to remember. <laughs> to be part of... <laughs> Her Majesty is royal. I mean, the United <laughs> States Navy. <laughs> okay, so why why is everyone back in Hawaii? Well, it's it's it, dude. If you're if you're a battleship head, if you're a naval vessel head, then you know you're all about the 75th annual Rim Pack Naval Games. Rim it's, job, it, naval. Yeah, games. the Rim Jack, the Rim, the Rim Pack Naval Games. It's like a I never miss it. It's a giant war game held between the United States, Japan's tiny self-defense navy, and the country of Malaysia, apparently. Yep. Those are the three countries involved in the RIMPAC naval games. Watch out, China. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what are they doing? They're playing a soccer game. They're playing a soccer game against the Japanese team. And you Two got- countries known for their love of soccer, <laughs> Japan and the United States. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Why don't they play baseball? Yeah. It's ridiculous. Why wouldn't they play baseball? Why wouldn't they play baseball? I, I feel like with that, like Peter Berg has to have like a son who's really into soccer. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's the mini- that's the like suburban dadness coming out there. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, Chunter, <laughs> you're making the Dartmouth soccer team. <laughs> We're gonna put a big soccer soccer scene in the Battleship movie. Uh, so like you know, uh, Taylor Kitsch is like he, you know, he, uh, he he's on the pitch. It's a bloody master class, you know, but they're, but they're, they're down. He has a chance to uh, make a penalty shot to, like, win the game. But, like, there's some, a bit of unsportsmanly like conduct by his uh, rival Japanese player, played by the great Japanese actor uh, Tadanobu Asano, who you right, might remember from such films as Ichi the Killer, Cafe Lumiere, Martin Scorsese's Silence, and one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Kiryoshi Kurosawa's Bright Future. Those are all movie mindset recommendations if you'd like to check them out. Um, so basically, he gets in a fight with a Japanese guy. Uh, he blows the game and blows the penalty kick because he's too damn headstrong. He, but he still wants to win. You got to be stubborn. You're so stubborn, mister. This, his brother basically is. A, you have to stop being stubborn if you want to improve. Yeah, he's like... I'm setting you up for character development right now. <laughs> um, basically, 
the United the US Navy soccer team loses to the Japanese soccer team at Pearl Harbor. Very shameful. It's yeah. Great very great, great dishonor. Great dishonor great brought upon shame. us. What we see next though is even more shameful. <laughs> when we see the real veterans. Oh, play. okay. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah, this is yeah, really, okay. Felix so started I, getting heated around this right, part. So, this was really upsetting. So, like, okay, like to, to kick off the rim job naval games, Admiral Shane, you know, is is is, is on the deck of the USS Missouri, the, uh, the 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 ship in which you know the the Japanese surrendered to the United States at the end of World War II, which is a nice own. Yeah, very much, very much. Um, and like Taylor Kitchen, Brooklyn Decker, like they show up and he's like, "Oh, they're late. Uh, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask your dad's permission for marriage, but you know, I'm too damn headstrong and cocky, and, and I don't know if he'll give me permission." So they show up late, and uh, Neeson's addressing the crowd, and he's like, "We're we're honored to be joined here today by some of the finest men who have ever served in the United States Navy." And they cut to like you know the the real World War II veterans who served on the Missouri during World War II. Now at this point in the movie, I was. I think, Felix, you were hoping they were actors portraying World War II veterans. We were and, not that lucky. And, and But, Matt, like, I mean, Peter Berg, Mr. Troop Sucker. He loves the troops so much. So I think and he insisted on... Yeah, he insisted. We need to make this to honor the troops. They said, hey, you want to make a movie about a board game, Peter? And he said, only if it honors the troops. <laughs> and boy, does... I mean... Oh, boy. Is there a... Okay, imagine. You're born in 1922. You lived through the Great Depression. You... Um, seven of your best friends, who are also your brothers, uh, are turned into just fucking puddles and ground chuck in front of you in Okinawa. You have five kids. One of them absolutely dies due to a lawnmower thing <laughs> because it's the 50s and 60s. Uh, one of your grandsons is, uh, you know, used in anti-ecstasy propaganda because he instantly died when he took... You know, some an e, an e pill in 1999 that was shaped like Lucky Charms, and then 13 years later, you are blessed with the final thing you'll ever remember: being in Peter Berg's battleship. <laughs> what a it's great all, American life! It's all worthwhile. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um. Uh, so then, uh, you know, Taylor Kitsch is like, he was like, oh, like I just need five minutes with your dad to. To the, do the old-fashioned but traditional thing to ask his permission um, to marry you, but he doesn't get a chance to do that before he gets in a damn a damn Donny Brook with uh, uh was, I'm sorry with a uh, Tata Noble Asano the, the 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 his his Jap his brass Japanese counterpart they get in a bathroom fight. Yep, they, they get they, in the bathroom they work fight. It out in the bathroom, and uh, then they go before you know Admiral Liam Neeson and he chews him out and he's like you know Taylor like Taylor Kitsch Admiral Hopper no sorry. Uh, Lieutenant Alex Hopper, you know, enjoy these, enjoy these rim job, enjoy this rim job because it's going to be your last one you ever get in the Navy. Yeah, you're gone. You're 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 out of here, bud. Um, but like, what I was wondering though is that like after dedicating these rim pack naval games to the veterans of the USS Missouri on board the USS Missouri, he's going to drum a lieutenant out of the Navy for beating up a Japanese guy. It's I got to tell you, my grandfather was an officer in the Navy. And he did not, uh, let's just say he did not have fond feelings towards Japanese people. Certainly not members of their Navy, their self-defense Navy. Yeah. Well, how would a man from Northern I mean, I guess Ireland... I it's the Imperial Navy, but still, you get, the, you get my drift. How would a man uh, born and raised in Northern Ireland and made a Navy admiral uh, <laughs> randomly one year feel about the Japanese? Probably ambivalent. <laughs> He'd probably be like, hey, don't beat one of those guys up in my bathroom. So they set out knowing that, A... There's absolutely no way him and the Japanese guy are going to become form some sort of like mutual respect and friendship. By the end of this no movie. way. They, they, they hate each, each other. other. They hate each other. Yeah. It's absurd to even imagine such a thing happening. And then, like also that like I mean his dreams of like you know a career in the navy and marrying the admiral's daughter. That's shit. Goodbye. In the gutter. Done. done. Not happen. Forget it. No Watch way. Watch out. What a f loser. Watch out. What a loser. He's just going back to being the Seven Eleven oaf yep. that he was at the beginning of the movie. So. They uh, embark on the uh, the naval games and oh, oh I forgot I forgot we're introduced to another wonderful character in this movie uh, Rihanna I don't know, I don't know what her character name is it's just Rihanna Rihanna's in Rihanna's the movie, in guys. the movie 
For some reason, Rihanna's in the movie. I think she wanted to just see what it's like to do acting, and she decided it was boring. She was like, or I'm making about a billion dollars off lipstick and underwear. Like, like I hanging wanted- around this, this set doesn't really do it for me. <laughs> yeah. and I respect her for making that decision. Peter Berg um, effectively deadened and siloed off any Rihanna acting career. It's yeah, true. Yeah, true. she was like, enough, of, no need. Was she in any other movies? I can't think of one. In this movie, she is, plays one of the lower troops. She's one of the gunners. She presses the button to blow things up. And she says something sassy right beforehand, usually. Not always, which is annoying, but usually. And then she does banter with Landry. And it's man. It is all, all the bants in this are just, it's Friday Night Lights in a sealed garage with a car running. Just dumber, slower, it's like less sort of witty. Like it's, supposed to, it's supposed to be like um, sort of uh, camaraderie. Yeah. It's supposed to show, it's supposed to show sort of an, an, an ease amongst um, yeah. men, men at arms and you know, uh, members of a team. Yeah, you know, but, but yeah, like, but but, but, but in this case, written by Chinese television, it's awful. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it, no recognizable human affect. The only real connection I found to Friday Night Lights in this is that the aliens resemble Buzz Bissinger <laughs> and his outfit choices. <laughs> God, <laughs> Take us to your God, Gucci yeah. store. <laughs> They're wearing yeah. huge oh, boots. I'm, 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 Landry, I'm telling you, the aliens only have one weakness. It's um, it's the troll flesh dungeons for sex with anonymous <laughs> men wearing ten thousand dollars slippers. <laughs> well, have your nipples twisted by, <laughs> by <laughs> have your nipples twisted through your, through a fucking ten thousand dollar cape. <laughs> Captain, you're gonna want to see this. It's the aliens platinum Amex statement. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, they got spikes coming out of their yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, fuck me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I believe at one point in the movie, Rihanna compares Taylor Kitsch's brash admiral to a combination of Donald Trump and Mike Tyson. And no, it's yep. not just because of the many rapes he's committed. Oh, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he's, he, that's not true about Taylor Kitsch. Or Alex Hopper. Yeah. It's weird to remember that Donald Trump was a cultural figure before he was. Yeah, it's odd. You know, it's always right? kind of a smack of the it's face when you encounter yeah. that old stuff. Yeah, all the rap songs where they're like, "I'm like Donald Trump," you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so with with the, with the Rim Pack Naval Games um, firmly afoot, uh, the the movie then takes time to set up the absolutely most dog shit death part of the plotline of the movie, which features uh, Brooklyn Decker as the physical therapist oh, to. A real life troop who's like actually in real life has become a motivational speaker after getting cyborg legs um, after losing them in Afghanistan or Iraq. This is the real Peter Berg troop sucking part of the movie. And it's just, you know, like he's he's he works with injured vets and teaches them how to how to walk again and how to be a man again. I got to say, having an entire section of this movie being a two hander devoted to two novices who don't know how to act was a really (laughs) smart move on Peter Berg's part. Like, if you're going to have either of these people in this movie, you pair them with an actor who knows what they're doing so that they can kind of carry them along instead of just putting them both out there to absolutely flail away and having no idea what they're doing. Yeah, the motivational speakers acting, I mean, I'm not even sure in his abilities as a motivational speaker. No, I've certainly never heard of him. Wouldn't I mean, wouldn't even begin to describe it. He just seems like granite. There's just nothing there. Just like this vague pissed off as this. I wonder, do people kill themselves after his speeches? <laughs> <laughs> no, like the only thing he's only able to firecracker s- goes. Like off. He, he just sounds like a vaguely, like he he sounds like a vaguely pissed off robot, like yeah. a robot that's really annoyed that you booted him up. Yeah, no, these are just these just interminable scenes. Um, but you know, we get some spice later on in those scenes in the form of a nerd. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. When they bring the nerd in, everything yeah. really pops. Yeah. Uh, the one, the one thing I like about uh, this plot line here is I love the idea that you're some like, like you're you're missing limbs. You're some like PTSD fried jarhead, and then they get you. They send you to a hospital in Hawaii, and they're like, "Here is like the hottest woman you've ever seen." And she's like, "Hi, I'll be your physical therapist." It's like, why do we feel sorry for these guys again? Why is John Stewart fucking crying about these dudes? Yeah, th- here's, yeah, seems like a pretty good deal. Here's today. your free yes. robot legs <laughs> yeah. and your Valkyrie, who's going to help you learn how to use them. Yeah, it like okay, if you work in like I don't know, a fucking uh, eraser plant, <laughs> what job could you lose your limb at in America anymore? <laughs> we don't really have like a lot of factories. Okay, let's say you work, you work, you work at LA Apparel. 
You work at the last factory in America, the LA Apparel Factory in Los Angeles, and you lose your arm in the t-shirt machine. (laughs) It's just like, all right, um, here's some aspirin. Back to work, asshole. Well, I mean, at this point in the movie, we've seen a lot of kind of like, you know, like satellite, like CGI, like, you know, satellites in orbit, like sending signals and shit. When are we going to see the aliens? Well, indeed, this, at this point in the movie, the aliens show up. While they're out rim jobbing each yeah, other. Yeah, they're, in they're the rim ocean. jobbing in the fucking Pacific Ocean, and some aliens show up on the planet. Uh, the nerd character, played by uh, Hamish Linklater, he is like, he's like, oh, sir, you're on with the White House now. And he's like, well, what? Uh, th- th- these are information. And like, essentially, um, it, it's a plot device in the movie that the alien communication mothership. Kind of crashes. Like crashes into crashes one of our satellites. Hong Kong. And, and it breaks up upon re-entry and like a huge chunk of it takes out like a half of Hong Kong. Yeah. So more anti-Chinese propaganda. Yes. And so the rest of these ships are without communication technic tech uh ability, which does not seem to me to scan. I'm sorry. I mean, yes, we need a giant array to send them a message. But they got here on a ship. Like they have that capacity. I, wouldn't they be able to communicate with their mother's planet with, like, a fucking cell phone, realistically? But whatever. They need to have them out of communication with so that they can't bring any more ships after that. So they got to well, have look, the, Matt, the thing smash into Hong Matt, Kong. Matt, okay, I, 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 I see the argument you're making. What I think it is very conceivable, given the logic of the movie, that one can make the rather small logical leap that this alien civilization, yes, they've mastered interstellar travel, but they've put the rest of their technology into into peg launching and not into <laughs> interstellar communications. Oh, God, They're doing the pegging. pegs. The pegging. They're doing the pegs, pegging. folks. We love the pegs. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, oh, yeah. And then, and then, like, in the sort of, like, the White House situation room, we get a lovable, charming character actor, the great Peter McNichol, who yes. you might remember from Ghostbusters 2. We- where, are you, where are you from? Up the west side. Up the west side. And of course, your favorite character from Veep, Jonah's Jeff, uncle, Jeff Kane. He's one of the really one of the funniest characters oh in the later God. seasons of Veep. Jeff Kane, what an amazing character! And he should have just played the. They, yeah, they should have been the same character in this yeah. movie. Oh my God! <laughs> Everyone in this movie deserved the Jeff Kane treatment. Really. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, the other alien ships they land in the Pacific Ocean. The rim job naval games needs to be diverted to investigate. And like they're sort of wondering, oh, is this an exercise? They got to look at it through their binoculars. There's, there's, al- there's damn dang alien obelisks sticking out of the ocean. <laughs> what are you gonna so do about just it? Like we're gonna take, we're gonna go take a gander. Well, okay, so like there, are, like, so in, in the Rimpack fleet, uh, there are there are three destroyers. Uh, one of them is captained by uh, Alexander Stone Sarsgaard. Stone Hooper. Yeah, Stone Hooper. Stone Hopper. Stone Hopper. One is Asano's ship. Um, a Japanese ship, and then there's another destroyer. Yeah. There are three destroyers in the fleet that they send to um, investigate the alien obelisks. They send Taylor Kitchen Rihanna on like a little little zip boat, little speed boat to the alien obelisk. And at this point in the movie, I was sort of struck by like I think it's I think because there's a little mini gun on the boat, they're looking pretty fly. And I was just thinking like I think it's cool that nowadays the Navy lets you wear that kind of like cool digital camouflage. Instead of like those sailor outfits, yeah, they got rid of the that like the goofy bell bottom deal. I yeah. don't know if you could take them seriously. Well, they if make they were still like that. They make you wear those when you like meet the president and you're not an officer. Yeah, they're like, yeah, here, go dress up like a girl because you have to meet Obama. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're at war, you get to look like you know a marine or a soldier or whatever. I mean, you know what happened is, is that they saw the cool digital camo and all the other branches, and they're like, we look like assholes. Well, yeah, we have it. it is, we have it in a nice blue, a shade, a shade of blue. Yeah. Um, it, it was the only remaining uniform that just you looked like a fucking goofball. Yeah. Oh, uh, so at this point, Taylor Kitsch, uh, they, 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 you know, they, they slide up to the alien obelisk, and at this point, Taylor Kitsch. Uh, displays why he should not just have been drummed out of the Navy, but probably put in the brig and sent to Leavenworth as well. Like a complete moron, he touches the obelisk, uh, gets blown up, and uh, wakes up the, the alien battleships. And at this point, Felix, you said the performance of the Navy in this movie in Taylor Kitsch sort of reminded you of those uh, sailors that Iran scooped up and gave juice boxes to. That was one of the greatest events in uh, naval history. Because they didn't even like... There is this weird story about this woman who was in the, uh, I think she was in the Navy. She was a Navy officer and she defected to Iran. And allegedly, um, after she defected, she tried to like interrogate these soldiers or these uh, sailors rather when they were captured. 
But it doesn't really seem like they got... It doesn't seem like these guys would have known anything. Yeah. And it seemed like just a way for the Iranians to be like, ha-ha, we're giving your guys juice boxes and making them wear blankets. <laughs> <laughs> Probably why they killed Soleimani. That was pretty embarrassing for the U.S. military. Well, the U.S. Navy gets embarrassed at this point, but to be fair, they're not going up against Iran. They're going up against a vastly technologically superior I alien mean, civilization. Kind of, yeah, again... Superior to uh, superior to a degree that can't even be con- conceived of uh, technologically in one sense because they got here, but in terms of their like weapons, in Pretty terms much the of same their, thing. Um, they are at bare parity with, with <laughs> yeah. the uh, American military. It's absolutely well. We'll, we'll discuss their weapons in a second, but uh, basically, uh, at like like before before the alien battleships emerge, uh, the obelisks cover. This like huge circumference of the Pacific Ocean in a force field, which you know blots out all radar and communications for like hundreds of miles, and like in cases traps all these ships on a battleboard, a grid, if you will, something like that. And uh, then Taylor, you know, uh, Alexander Sarsgaard, uh, his ship gets owned. Uh, well, the thing is, like, you have to get, okay, the alien war technology. They fire pegs. Yep. The little plugs from the game battleship. They fire those. They shoot them in the they air. They shoot them in the air like. Woo! And then they d- 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 and they spin into these ships and they sort of like punch and, and punch into the side in, of the ship. And then when they hit, they, l- they go in farther, and then the whole thing blows up, and just they, like in the game. Just yeah. like in the game. And this was the saddest part of the entire movie. This was right when we paused and realized this movie was not eighty-seven minutes long as it should have been designed <laughs> to be, and we did in fact have over an hour to go. <laughs> this is the emotional. Yeah. Like the emotional dead center of the movie. Yeah, and that's when you finally get. Hey, remember the battleship? No. It is. We've, they finally remind you. They, you know? they remember the, just like the game. Hey, the premise. That I you, think the movie did a beautiful job of of depicting the game of battleship. Absolutely, the throwing the pegs in the air, uh, <laughs> knocking the board over. Knocking when you got the board. so frustrated with how fucking boring it is. Yeah, and Alexander Sarsgaard. That is his last memory. <laughs> you know is losing battleship to the aliens. <laughs> but at no point does anyone say, you sunk my battleships. No That's one true. says it. Th- there's they, a line, there's a line inver- that gets close to that at the end of the movie. We'll get to that. But we'll get like, to that. you cannot not have that in the movie. I'm sorry. So basically, the, 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 the sort of more upright elder brother who's sort of like trying to keep Taylor Kitsch on the straight and narrow, he gets blowed the fuck up. His whole ship goes down. He, he's fucking destroyed. Him and all his men. Dead, dead. Going to Davy Jones's locker. So Kitsch gets back to his ship. I forget. Oh, because he's on another battleship. I don't fucking know. He or was destroyer, on the destroyer. small boat. Then yeah, he sorry, went on sorry, the Japanese, or he went on the other destroyer. And then uh, the uh, Japanese ship also got owned by the the pen, the plugs. And then he decides that he is going to kamikaze do- attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he they pull him back on his ship, and they're like, they're like, he's like, uh, like, where's the captain? And they're like. Sir, you're the captain. You're the highest ranking officer, like left alive. We need orders. We need orders, sir. And they're like surveying the the, the smoldering wreckage of their two other battle, two other destroyers. Uh, I thought, hey, those are those are Ali Burke class destroyers. Yes. I'll have you know. Uh, they're seeing this leviathan alien fucking dreadnought bearing down on them, and they're like, sir, sir, we need orders. And he's like, oh, you want an order? Here's an order. Full attack. Full steam ahead, ram into this ship, let, let, let loose all guns at this thing. And at this point, there should have been a mutiny. Yeah. They, they should have they, thrown they, his they, ass yeah, overboard. They should, have, they should have mutinied immediately, surrendered to these aliens, given up. Yeah, because this uh, is insane. Be like the Keel mutineers of 1917. He's like, they killed my brother. Yeah. He, wants the, he wants the suicide attack it, it was, alien ship. Yeah, so it's like, oh, so like the whole movie is supposed to be about this guy being tested and then finding his character. And it's like, oh, here it is. He's a psycho, a uh, nihilist demon willing to kill everyone in his own ship. And at one point, the thing that stops him is, is that somebody says, hey, there's survivors of the Japanese ship. There's sailors in the water. Should we go and get them? And at first, he's like, no, fuck them. First, I want them to drown and everyone in my ship to die just so that I could, I could express how sad I am that my brother got blown up. With no indication that they even have the capability of harming the aliens. Yes. Like, failure through and through. Yeah. And finally, they, like, snap it into him, and he's like, oh, yeah, I won't do that. And then... They disengage, and then somehow they just stop fighting for a while, and things just other stuff happens, and then it's nighttime. I think you could sum up seventy-five to eighty percent of the movie with other stuff happens. Yeah, 
Well, and, uh, and, and Tyler Noble Asano is, is alive. He's not dead. You th- I thought he was dead earlier. They pull him, they out, they pull of the him out of the water. with the other survivors. Um, but at this point in the movie, we should we talk about the, the aliens. They got, they got another trick up their sleeve. They got another weapon in their arsenal. That weapon, not featured in the original Battleship board game. And I was very upset about this. For those like, what, what, this is not canon. The alien, they're, they're, it's no, not canon. There it's are a no, buzz there, ball. There are no buzz balls in the game of Battleship. But the aliens in this movie... Uh, they they launch buzz balls. They got buzz balls. They launch, they launch buzz balls at uh, military and civilian infrastructure in Honolulu and all over Hawaii. Uh, the buzz balls, Matt. I think I think you could hit the nail right on the head here. They are like the slightly upgraded version of uh, the Langoliers. Yeah, Stephen King's The Langoliers. Have you seen that TV miniseries? The sort of uh, writhing masses of teeth that um, consume the past and everything in it. Yeah, uh, that's what they look like. And they just launch them seemingly at random. Uh, they show you inside the buzz ball so you know that it's guided by some sort of uh, intelligence as it's been around. Uh, and it it, it, try, it it goes up to a kid on a baseball field because it goes into it gets launched all the way into uh, Hawaii. Uh, and it stops in front of this kid. And it's like, oh, the, it, the kid in its vision is like green. So it's like, oh, then I'm not going to hit the kid. Instead, I'm going to bulldoze over the support beams of this fucking eight lane highway yeah. that's got hundreds of fucking cars on it. <laughs> yeah. So it and uses- that's again, we're like, these aliens are just us we're thin, small fig leaf of like, Oh, we can't do that. And they're just otherwise allowing us to do whatever we want and kill over. So like, yeah, like, like one of our ago- drone operators is like, Oh, there's one individual child. That would, that would violate the laws of war. Um, like, like here's a, here's a, here's a, like a water purification facility that has like some maybe technical militaries. We'll blow that up and kill thousands yep. of children or, yep. or an entire highway overpass that's going to crush a school bus. Yep. But, you know, hey, look, we didn't try to kill those kids. We didn't know they were just... Ten years ago, Elon Musk saw this movie and was like, oh, my God, I know how our self-driving car system is going to work. It's exactly the same thing. Well, no, the Elon Musk the self-driving car would do the opposite. It would just plow straight <laughs> through that kid on the highway. <laughs> Hit the kid, uh, do a pit maneuver, <laughs> turn it, go into the other lane, hit a water purification plant, blow up. The buzz balls are so baffling, and to me, they reek of st- uh, some studio executive in the chain in, during the making of this movie who just got it in his head that that would be cool and like and made them do it. Because otherwise, I don't know where they came from. What What's the point of them? They don't do anything. The pegs I get, they're stupid, but it makes sense. Yeah. It's from the game. What are the buzz balls? Because they don't figure into anything. They don't do anything. You know, I got to say, God bless Fortnite. Because, okay, everyone makes fun of how Fortnite now is now. It's like the, the kitchen sink drain for all culture. Things that you can't spin off into their own thing necessarily. So it's like Predator. Yeah, Goku, Darth Predator, Vader, yeah. Darth Vader, Homer Simpson. Yeah. They're everyone, Chef from South Park. They're all fighting each other. They're all uh, shooting uh, laser beams and Man, have lightsabers. Chef would have a huge hitbox. No, thank you. Yeah, no, you don't want to play as him. But the, I think that has prevented more of these movies from being made. You can just put the buzz ball in Fortnite. Right. If you're Viacom or whatever, yes. you'll be like, hey, we're going to license you the buzzball idea for $17 million, <laughs> and you don't have to make this movie. You can finally kill Peter Berg. <laughs> um, well, like, the buzzballs, Battleship, the fact that they realized that if they spent, if they wasted more money making this movie, it would actually be profitable for tax purposes, or they would lose less money if they spent more money making it. Yeah. And the fact that it got made to begin with, is this another, is this another movie where you have to ask yourself, like the ironclad, the ironclad proposition that when faced with many movies in Hollywood, was everyone on cocaine at every stage of making this movie? If it was on, if they were on cocaine, this would be more fun. I think this is like Ritalin, perhaps. Yeah, that's the thing. It's the cocaine. The, the, the great uh, action films of the 80s and 90s were cocaine. Now it's just Ritalin. Now it's just yeah. a bunch of uh, uh, sc- uh, homework addicts. <laughs> yeah. Don Simpson would not wipe off bronzer with this script. <laughs> Um, okay, at this point in the movie, um, it's back to Brooklyn Decker and uh, the oh, truth God. guy and like whatever aliens, uh. alien soldiers land on Hawaii. And, it, and OK, like at, at this point in the movie, I was like, look, if it's if it's like a sort of a, an ocean based like naval uh, combat movie, I can fuck with that. I, I like I like I like I like Navy ships shooting fucking cannons at each other and like those awesome like uh, the, the like the mini guns that they use to shoot missiles when they that are fired at the ship. Those things are awesome. 
But the movie truly does grind to a halt, not just when Brooklyn Decker and the guy with no legs are on screen, but when they attempt to show the aliens as anything other than just like large piece, like large robot engines on an ocean. Yeah, they they have they show the aliens a lot. And they do, they are just like people. They have four fingers instead of five. And they have like these spiky beards, kind of. They look like West Borland. But otherwise, <laughs> they basically are just people with sort of l- l- reptile eyes. Uh, and when they're on land, you're, they act so, they, their interactions with humans are very weird. Sometimes they're just murdering them like nothing. And then other times they're sort of like just humoring them and sort of patting them on the head and ignoring them. Uh, it th- none of it makes sense. But this is when uh, the boring ass troop and uh, his boring ass PT lady find the nerd mm-hmm. uh, Hamish Linklater, who is the most annoying version of this character I think I've ever seen in a movie. Every thing he says is, "I am a whiny bitch who wants you should kill me. Why am I alive?" That's every line of dialogue. Um, at the same time as this is unfolding on the uh, island of Hawaii, um, and like this other thing. This is this the guy with no legs. This is his first day of physical therapy. I think so. They, oh, I don't know. This is like Brooklyn Decker's like, okay, well, let's let's hike up a mountain in Hawaii. Well, yeah, he's but like, he Liddy, keep, I just got these fucking legs put on me. Yeah, like. but he keeps saying how the mountain is nothing to him and how it's. Oh yeah, my grandmother could fly climb this, and she's dead. Fuck you. <laughs> he's just very hostile, very unpleasant man. And I think you're supposed to be like, oh yeah, because he got his legs blown off, but. You know, as Felix kept yelling at the screen while we were watching this, <laughs> nobody made you do that. Yeah, no, he is acting like it, it, he got drafted. The opposite happened. <laughs> you were like, I really want a communications degree. <laughs> Perhaps a that that cool Dodge station wagon, not even a Charger. Um, uh, while this is happening on the island of Hawaii, back inside the battle, the battle board inside the force field, uh, Taylor Kitchen Company have have fished an alien soldier out of the water. So, oh boy, we're going to see some more of this. And at this point in the movie, they have like an unconscious alien soldier and he's in sort of like his mech suit or whatever. And they're all looking at it. Landry's doing quips. Uh, and, and Rihanna has my favorite line in the movie. Where he looks at the, where she looks at the alien and she says, my dad said they would come my whole life. Her, her father, <laughs> that's right, Whitley Stryber in his book Communion. <laughs> Is this when we came up with the idea of the post-credits, like goof him up se- sequence of... Uh, just like how we had the real Pearl Harbor veterans, we were going to have real Unit 731 <laughs> veterans vivisecting the alien soldiers and sewing them together. <laughs> but then also, uh, um, again, and at this point in the movie, uh, the alien soldier, of course, wakes up. He uh, grabs Taylor Kitsch, and in a blatant, blatant, shameless ripoff of Independence Day, upon being touched by the alien, uh, Taylor Kitsch is sort of like in his mind's eyes telepathically sees their whole plan, which is to do the board game battleship on every planet. That I they mean, I don't really get it because he never says what he yeah, no, he never, from that. Yeah. And the images are, it's like kind of a recapitulation was, I don't, I never got anything related to the aliens at all. The alien runs amok on the destroyer. Uh, they fight the alien. It uses it sort of like a red, you're dead, green, you're feeling pretty keen system to assess the technology among humans like horseshoes, safe. Uh, gun, red, bad, kill. And then um, Taylor Kitsch distracts it while Rihanna points a giant cannon at his yeah, head yeah. and then blows it away before saying, Mahalo, motherfucker. Mahalo, like, motherfucker. <laughs> mother boop. And she blows, she blows the alien away with, yeah. with, a, with a, a cannon from a destroyer. Yeah, he's got his whole suit on at that point with its, his readout, his digital readout helmet, and he cannot hear or see a fucking cannon moving towards his head a foot from it yeah i would say that the aliens were sent by an alien donald rumsfeld they were ill prepared for this war (laughs) i mean maybe that's the way you imagine it you're like these guys are like us you know it's like they're just the intergalactic fuck up versions of us like all these guys just want to dodge dodge challengers too i mean shit like we we lost the Viet Cong. yeah that's true yeah we were vastly but again see the problem i have with that is just a conceptual level it assumes that, like, the distance between this society and one yeah, that has the ability to travel to yeah. interstellar yeah. is, like, not that big. It's so big. Yeah. We would have to be so different. Any society would have to be so vastly different to get there, to just have such a paucity of imagination. They're just like, yeah, no, they're just like us. At this point, it's sort of like they reveal that the aliens are on Hawaii because there's, like, some fucking, like, SETI, like, satellite disarray on a mountain. And, like, they've lost their communication ship. 
and they need to use the same satellite system that we use to send the signal to planet Top G, Andrew Tate's war room. <laughs> um, They're repelled by Andrew Tate's mage. <laughs> Uh, so the aliens need to communicate back with Planet G. They need to establish a line of communication, as the, the motivational speaker, combat veteran, says. The most important part about any battle, establishing lines of communication. Or, as the nerd says, you're saying E.T. wants to phone home? Uh, <laughs> this was a cue for the audience to kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, certainly what I felt. At, at, th at this point in the movie... Uh, uh, Landry, uh, Jesse Plemons, uh, through some convoluted story about his pet lizard, in, after putting on the alien helmet and realizing something about the visor, he, he tells Taylor Kitsch that like, he had a pet lizard and he took the beach one day, which is a bad idea because the lizard's eyes couldn't handle direct sunlight or something like that. Yeah. So he, he, he intuits that um, the aliens, their, their weakness, that's right, sunlight. I, it's this the is, sun, baby. That is the thing I don't get. Okay, so the aliens have a weakness of sunlight. If you're going to fight a war on a planet that is famous for its access to sunlight, wouldn't you have a plan to, like, block it out while you're trying to take over the planet? Well, here's the thing. I think the assumption of the filmmakers, and I honestly think I saw some, like, uh, read some articles about this movie when it came out because it was such a hilariously misconceived notion. The theory they had was, like, well, this isn't an invasion force. This is a reconnaissance force. So they weren't necessarily planning on going to fight. They just had the mix up where the thing crashed and now they kind of have to. Uh, but even then, again, that level of technology, you're going to have always a contingent for the sun exists. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the aliens are trying to hijack the satellite, um, but then uh, back, back on board the ship, um, they, they have to come up with a way. How do we, how do we fight these alien dreadnoughts? How do, we, how do we even fire our, our, our cruise missile? How do we fire our missiles and use any of our offensive weapons systems against them if all our radar is knocked out? At that point, um, uh, Asano is beginning to tell um, Captain Taylor Kitsch about um, some sort of like um, sonar-based like, uh, detection system that the Japanese, the tiny Japanese self-defense Navy has been using against the U.S. Navy in some sort of capacity. That wasn't I think really to like clear. Get, a, get an edge up on those rim oh, and, job and, and, games. In the, the, the rim job We games. want to win those and games. He's like, he's like what, <laughs> what it is is, is that they're able to connect to a network of uh, tsunami detecting buoys. Ah, uh, yes, that's it. That are all out there and that are there to, they measure, you know, waves so that if there's big increase, they can let people know ahead of time. And they're all out there in a grid pattern. And they got a signal that goes through the, all of them so that they can read when they see a change in, temp, uh, change in waves as the alien ships, which are always... And what is that? We have That's right. our second battleship mention of the film. That's right, folks. All your favorite battleship coordinates are there. I was pointing at the screen. Yo, B3! It's B3! Look, look! C8! Damn! It's C8! A11, my dog! I did like, though, um, when, uh, when uh, Asuna is um, explaining their, their sonar detection system to Taylor Kitsch, like, giving him the keys to defeat the aliens, Taylor Kitsch is like, I don't have time for this Art of War bullshit! And he's like, that book's shiny as ass. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong country. You just have to find the biggest one in the continent. <laughs> uh, okay, then cut back to the island of Hawaii. And like, okay, th th this scene he talks about, like, I think this scene really um, does sum up Peter Berg's attitude towards like the military and our relationship to the military. Because they're like, uh, the nerd has established that he can establish communications with the naval fleet and order in, uh, you know, uh, a barrage of uh, a shelling of the satellite network, of the satellites on the mountainside, um, so that the aliens can't contact their home planet. And he's like, well, yeah, I, c I could go if I go to my lab, but my lab is crawling with alien soldiers. And, like, you know, I can't do that. I'm just a, I'm just a scientist. And at that point, the, the half-man motivational speaker is just like, you are, you are, you are going over the top. Like you're do he basically is ordering the civilian on a suit like to his death. Yeah. No, no training. This is and they're not just like, the reason he why. Go he goes, you will acquire the courage to do this. Yep. And I just think of that in light of uh, Peter Berg, the, the insane interview that Peter Berg gave to promote this movie where he uh, berated an Israeli journalist to, 
to sign up and join the you military. Got to join the army. Got to join up. Got to join uh, up. Chris, see if you can edit in the audio of that in, in, insane hectoring of this uh, Israeli movie critic or yeah. whatever, which is uh, pretty uh, funny to begin with. If, if you attack uh, Iran now, they're going to fight you back, right? There's going to be blood. Uh, Israelis will die, right? Yes. No question. Would you rather take that now or let them get a nuclear bomb? It's the most serious issue facing our planet today. Well, more, more, more so than the movie Battleship, which you know, I'm very excited to have directed. And I love Rihanna. She's a great actress and did a wonderful job in the film. And my dad was a Navy historian. And have you been in the Israeli army? No. What? How'd you no. get out of that? Are you a draft dodger? Uh, How old are you? How old are you? 25. You've got to join the army, motherfucker. Well, yeah, How'd you do. You it's, a long, it's a long, it's a What's long, it's a long story. What's your name? I'm Jason. Jason what? Holt. Jason Holt. Don't yes. you have... Holt doesn't sound Jewish. Uh, well, my dad's Jewish. Okay, my dad is too. You don't have to join the Israeli army? You do. Well, how, when are you going to join? Um... We're not having this conversation. It's, uh, <laughs> I feel like I was bombed. Pleasure. Pleasure. That was a good one. Boom. It's like Peter Berg. Um, calm down. You were in the last seduction, not uh, the Battle of Chosin Reservoir. Okay, <laughs> he calm was. Down. He was. He. By the way, not a veteran. And this is the thing. What's the deal? You're like he's, he didn't even join up. What is this? Dad was a marine. So this is all Oedipal fucking drama. It's all bourgeois fantasy bullshit. A real fucking veteran would not make a movie like this. Like, and we know that because like Samuel Fuller would, yeah, not, would not make a movie like he this. He would not. Mm-hmm. He would not disgrace the uh, the the uh, like the experience of war. Yeah. With like a, a, a <laughs> using the <laughs> using the historical lens of the uh, battle, like the 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 war in the Pacific during World War II to make a Hasbro Films board game yeah, movie right. that is also a giant recruitment poster for the Navy. And I, and the thing is, if he did, if he was like taking a, po- a check, he would not have done this neurotic suck job on the military as part of it. He would have the confidence not to do that. Yeah, but we don't get like guys like F- Sam Fuller to direct movies anymore. It's all coddled brats who never had any other job. Um, so at this point, um, the Destroyer uses the, the, the battleship sonar detective system to... Uh, do combat with the alien dreadnoughts. Um, it, it's miss. a miss. It's a miss. And like, like, oh, they're like, okay, you have to lead them, you asshole. Yeah. And then um, finally, wouldn't that be the first thing you learn in the Navy? Like yeah. that, that your fucking missiles aren't hit scan. <laughs> yeah, but they never had to do it with the grid before. That's this true. Is, they're, they're they're making it up as they go along. That's true. And they eventually do hit and blow up one of the alien ships. Um, at this point in the movie. I was getting bored, and I took a mild disassociative. So the rest of the plot becomes <laughs> it, a little bit not vague. It becomes a little bit vague to me. Um, so uh, t- uh, t- Taylor, Taylor Kitsch- Kitchen uh, and and uh, yeah, Taylor Kitchen Asano use the sun to snipe the alien ship and blind them. Yeah, I mean, like these aliens stink. They, 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 they stink. No these shot. are the worst aliens you say, I like, think of all was, time. Like, was their plan was to take over the whole planet before the sun came out no, or something? I mean, like I said, even if they, even if it's just like a reconnaissance, like they do, just they get rinsed. It's embarrassing. Like these guys had to have been like, like, like members of like McNamara's morons. Yeah, of that planet. It's embarrassingly terrible. These are aliens who like never took the alien SATs. Yeah. This is like a lowering of alien recruiting standards. Like, okay, if it's a reconnaissance force, they didn't they didn't recon anything because they all die. <laughs> what are what are they gonna come back with? Oh, they have an ocean. Yeah, we already knew that because that's where we fucking dropped your ship into, you fucking idiots. Oh, uh Scotland exists. Oh, uh if you crash into Hong Kong, you'll kill a bunch of people in an apartment building. Holy shit, thank you guys for your sacrifice. <laughs> Shitty, just <laughs> shittiest aliens of all time. I will admit this was the point in the movie where I spent 30 minutes looking for projectors to buy. <laughs> you got Be- one, though. I did buy one. Uh. So, you know, that is one thing this movie has going for it. Okay, so uh, Taylor, uh, uh, Lieutenant Taylor Kitsch's ship gets eaten by buzz balls. They make it to the life, the lifeboats, and they limp back into Pearl Harbor feeling, you know, defeated. And they're like, what are we going to do? And Asuno goes, we have no more ships. And Taylor Kitsch goes, we got one. That's right. The, the USS Missouri. 
Da, 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 and they realize they're, they're on board the ship, and they're like, they're like, but this ship is over 50 years old. Its firing systems are analog. And who are we going to get to crew this thing? And then one by one, they oh, just no. see pop up out of like the little gun ports and fucking like, uh, like uh, gangplanks of this ship. It's the... Uh, like you know, the actual World War II veterans, all eighty plus years yeah. old now, <laughs> and you know, yeah, another Montage. another bad <laughs> military actor, <laughs> another ACDC song. Montage. <laughs> At this point, Felix, you said uh, that this is worse than the Bonus Army and what they're doing to these uh, military veterans. Absolutely, absolutely. Like this is deeply insulting. I mean, to everyone, and. My heart sank. My heart sank when I heard them speak and realized they're not they're their acting is too shitty and wooden. These are actual guys who are in the war, probably. And Peter Berg scoured his personal connections to find these guys and just fucking herded these senile guys around for um just, what's it just um scale, I think, probably. Nothing else. <laughs> And gave them their last memory. They probably died instantly after. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they did this movie with aliens because there is no naval power on Earth that the United States can plausibly fight against. Yeah. So you can't really do it contemporary. And presumably they didn't do it in World War II because they thought that would have cheapened it somehow by making it about World War II. But by having these vets in it, it's way worse than if they just made it about World War Two <laughs> yeah. with regular yeah. people instead with regular of actors, and poor instead of, old men instead of someone who's fought at the Battle of yeah. Midway. Do you think like if any of those guys like died in Hawaii while they were filming it, Peter Berg's like, oh, I get to keep his skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> I have the greatest World War II memorabilia of all time. I, I the skeleton it. of a guy who was, was really at Pearl Harbor. Uh, I know. I, I have to go. Uh, one more Felix joke here. This this was the point when you said the the the, the Japanese um, um, combatants in the Rimpact Naval Games should have taken some of their old timers, like kamikaze pilots who who bitched <laughs> out or or survived, yeah. and give them a chance to redeem their honor. That would have been awesome. Like that would have been an actual creative thing you could do with that scene, where it's yeah. like the vet, the American vets and the Japanese vets like lock eyes, and it's like, oh my god, okay, you like you tried. That would have been really good. That would have been and awesome. Then those, and then the old dudes just smash into the side of the alien ship. <laughs> yeah, that would have been awesome. But no, like not creative yeah. enough. Or yeah, then or unit seven thirty five dissecting them. <laughs> unit seven thirty one. Seven, fuck. 731 dissecting. There's so many creative things you could do here that he just refused to. And it's not out of respect for the veterans. Uh, we know that uh, because he put them in battleship. What, and, he did, uh, what he did have is he had one of those veterans say, well, they're do well, the battleship is duking it out uh, with the last alien ship. They're not going to sink this battleship. No way. That yeah. is just that is so the, uh, the whole rousing climax of this movie where we get, you know, you get you get Plemons. You get Rihanna doing some fucking doing some riffs with these these old timers, you know. They're like, I, can you up. imagine what got what got left on the yeah. cutting room floor yeah. there? Yeah, they they had to they had to have a sensitivity reader on. Oh my god, the set for that one. They had to, they had to keep Grandpa distracted. The, the uh, fucking hat guy probably guessed forty nine different races that we haven't even heard categorized since nineteen fifty seven. Um, Are you a Circassian deer? <laughs> There was a belly dancer in Morocco who had your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I married a 14-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I say is worse than putting them in this movie, okay? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And, okay, so, like, the rousing climax of this movie is sort of like uh, the, 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 the young top guns of, the, of today's modern Navy teaming up with World War II veterans to fight an alien battleship with the historic USS Missouri. Now, I sort of, I, I, view the, the, I, view, I view the climax of this movie as kind of the cinematic equivalent of those like news stories that you see go viral every so often that are something like, this 83-year-old man has been bagging groceries for 30 years. His community pitched in and bought him a car so he can keep bagging groceries. And I just think, like, they, it's like, this isn't rousing and heroic. They shouldn't have to be doing this. Like They feel yeah. honored. <laughs> yeah, okay. Their service is being honored, you, 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 you snoots. <laughs> I'm sure, honestly, the fact thing is they probably all had a very nice time. I'm sure they did. They like they got people to paying meet attention Rihanna, to them. Okay. They got to meet Rihanna. Yeah, I've never people met Rihanna. Attention That'd to be them. awesome. Yeah, that would be sick. 
it was like in the moment it was a nice moment it was a, it was a it was you know what it was a trip outside the house i'm sure <laughs> they appreciated true. it that's true do you think like do you think they gave them anything like fun i think they probably did yeah like Maybe, you know, they probably brought some celebs over to say hi to him. No, I mean, but like, like you know, one of those gift baskets where it's like, oh. Oh, sw- we- swag bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like, they definitely gave him some swag. Got some, some Warby Parker yeah. Lynn yeah. Okay. glasses. Yeah. Okay, okay, now I feel better about that. They this. probably gave him cool bomber jackets Ooh. Ooh. for the movie. Oh, Matt, you have the Con Air crew jacket? I have the Con Air crew that's jacket. That's a bomber jacket. That's awesome. Yeah. Could have given them cool yeah. battleship crew jackets. I have that This Is Us crew jacket. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jim gave me that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim gave that to me. Oh, wow, that's brutal. <laughs> it's a wonder. No, it's a great gift. I no, it's amazing. It. I want to. I want that now. It just. It simply does not get cold enough here to yeah, wear it. Yeah, that's true. But I'll, I'll take it home for Christmas. All right. Um. So basically, uh, they they they're on the USS Missouri and they use um like the the art of war is referenced again. He, I don't know, he, they use yeah. Is there something in the art of war about blinding your opponents? He does. He does this deal where he's moving in one direction. And uh, the, they're shoot, they're they're launching their their uh, the pegs at him again, but then he drops anchor and it like snaps the ship out of the trajectory it was on and the, all the ships miss, and then it comes the whole ship comes broadside, so that it's all of its guns are facing. Yeah, the they, 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 and they, they light it up. They light it up. Light it up. And of course, that's where you go. They press the button, and then, here's what here's the annoying thing for me, a little personal annoyance. So three times in this movie, Rihanna. Uh, says something or presses a button that blows something up. And the first time she says, Mahalo, mother. Boom. <laughs> Second time she just goes, Boom. Third time, nothing. Mm-hmm. The climactic one. Uh, and they blow him up. The ship sinks. They blow up the alien ship. Congratulations. Congratulations, aliens. <laughs> <laughs> they did indeed sink the alien battleship. I'm trying to think what this is the equivalent of. Like a human. Getting like killed by like a family of squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm sure it's possible, but you really have to fuck up for that to happen. Um, it, and then like back in the Island of Hawaii, like uh, the, the injured vet, the nerd, and Brooklyn Decker, they they fight in hand to hand combat. They, whatever, they literally have a fist fight. They have with a fist the fight with alien. the alien, as you described him, Felix. Like basically the elites from Halo. Yeah. yeah. And this guy who's like literally taking walking classes beats the shit out of him. Yeah, it just annihilates him. But then uh, the alien unfairly like is like, oh, what if I hit your hit your fucking uh, <laughs> your peg legs and you know knocks him to the ground? And then boom, here comes the nerd to the rescue. Yeah, the actually, nerd- I thought it was gonna be Brooklyn Decker. Uh, the nerd redeemed himself. The nerd redeemed himself. And once again, like you know, like uh, Peter Berg. Uh, giving a nerd a chance to justify his existence, not because of like you know, um, like like Felix, it's to compare the money that went into training the motivational speaker and um, the money invested in like I don't know a top scientist or engineer in inter-satellite communications. Uh, it doesn't seem like one would have to justify their life to the other in Peter Berg's moral calculus. But P- also, Felix, you had an excellent, excellent observation about how we know Peter Berg is an evil person. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. So when Peter Berg was on Entourage. He was portrayed as a cool, badass, nice man. That's how you know in real life he is a monster who has probably killed people, if not all the veterans on this movie. He may have had the first copy of COVID eight years ago and given it to all of them. Um, it is a hard and fast rule. Hard and fast rule. If you were on Entourage and you were portrayed in any way as cool or likable, yourself. Like playing, playing yourself, yourself yeah. cool or likable, you are a monster in real life. But if you let yourself be played as an asshole, you're awesome. Yeah. You're the man. Seth Green, uh, Jason Patrick, I think. Um, who, who else was like an asshole in Entourage? If you're hearing this seven years from when we <laughs> recorded this, you know, hit, hit, hit us at chopotraphouse at viacom.com and let us know who played I've themselves. I've never seen Entourage. <laughs> If you would like to replace Matt Chris, <laughs> if you've seen Entourage, <laughs> frozen because I've never seen that show. You know, I'm not going to say it's a great show, nor am I going to say it's a bad one. But I'm certainly going to say it's a show you would watch to calm down after The Sopranos. <laughs> after that one got you all hyper. Yeah, you're like, oh, what's going to happen with Phil? And then um, it's like, oh, is uh, 
is Vincent Chase going to fuck Scarlett Johansson? And it's like, probably he fucks every girl he wants. <laughs> Johnny Drama, he has a 40% success rate. Jerry Ferrara, actually closer to 70%. E also fucks every single girl he wants. Unrealistic. It's Ari Gold, beautiful wife. I don't remember how many kids Ari Gold had. Probably two. Um, D- D- Lloyd, his assistant, I think he gets a boyfriend at the end. The end of Entourage, um, there's a very confusing storyline where Vincent fucks Sasha Gray and she gets him addicted to cocaine. And that's all you need to know. So now you've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get it now? I got it now. I got it. Okay, well, now, now okay. tell me who played themselves on Entourage. <laughs> Wasn't James Cameron? Was he an yeah, asshole? No, no, he played James Cameron was portrayed as a nice guy on on, on, ah, on uh, well, But we know he's like kind of an asshole because he's like a Napoleon. Like Napoleon was probably an asshole. That's true. That's fine. Yeah, that's I don't true. care. He. I want him to be yeah. mean. He has a lot to do. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think you can fairly compare the films of James Cameron to that of Peter Berg. Though I mean, they're they're equal in many respects in that they were on Entourage together. <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. Peter Ber- Peter Berg next to James Cameron is like uh, the humans versus the aliens in this movie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. God, what what even? I guess like an ant building a little fucking shrine out of twigs and I am pay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, he's not even he's he is a mere shadow of Michael Bay. I mean, how could the hell could he compare to Cameron? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think we're we're almost at the end of this movie. Basically, uh, Brooklyn Decker calls in the fucking. She she calls in the 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 barrage of uh, shelling to blow up the uh, satellite system. It's one the, giant it's shell. One that giant they have to shell. Dramatically move across the boat and then put into the big gun. They, yeah, they, they stuff up that hole. They blast off. They blow up the satellite. The aliens' lines of communication cut off. And then like, but they fire the buzz balls at the USS Missouri, and you think, oh boy. Like another another historical landmark gone to shit, and you know, um, Asano and Kitch, they're like, it was an honor serving with you. Salute as the buzz balls bear down on them, but like, nope, the buzz balls are intercepted by naval aviators by by Tom Pete Maverick himself. Because hey, remember Liam Neeson? He's still here. Oh well, yeah, Liam Neeson's yeah, yeah. still in this movie. He's still in this movie because the force field is now down, and that means that the rest of the fleet can be, can show up, and they send in the 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 uh the fighters and they blow up all the buzz balls and then they fucking use all their guns and missiles and such on the the ships and that's the end i want to point out um when they were carrying the the torpedo or whatever to fire at the alien lines of communication it was a couple world war ii veterans two japanese guys and two like normal navy guys which is all three types of people in this movie. That's <laughs> <laughs> the only characters in this entire movie. Um, and, you know, they're all rewarded for their heroism. Um, Captain Stone Cooper is, you know, posthumously awarded uh, a medal for his valor and bravery and dying. Um, Taylor Kitsch, though, um, the guy who saved Earth from the alien invasion, only given the silver star. A fucking silver star. The third best thing you can get. Like, what do you need? The only guys who get medal of, medals of honor are like Navy SEALs where it's like, oh, your Osprey crashed and you died and you didn't actually do anything, but we're giving it to you after you died. So your son can like go to war college for so, free. Taylor Kitsch, he gets the silver star from Admiral, Admiral Shane, Liam Neeson, who in this movie, uh, they do make clear he is in charge of the Ohio fleet of the U.S. Navy. Yeah. <laughs> to Admiral Shane. <laughs> What a great name. Um, and then, but then he asks Liam Neeson for his daughter's hand in marriage, and Liam Neeson says no. Turns him down. But then, of course, there's a bit of lighthearted There's dance. a little wink. There's like, a little we'll wink, and then he's right. saying, I'll discuss the service. We'll discuss it with Chicken Burrito. Yeah. Call yeah. back. Call back. Call back. Yeah. Here's the thing is, we're, the movie's ending, and I'm just thinking, what are you people so excited for? You should all be just fucking, like, kissing each other and lying down and praying, because you're all going to die, because... Okay, you stop them from communicating, but they know where they are. They know where they went. You were the ones who sent them the message, and they those guys showed up. They'll just send more guys. Yeah. So if there are more guys, they will. You will not catch them aware.s They will annihilate you. No more messages into deep space. No more trying to contact alien civilizations. Read the three body problem for more on this. Okay, so. One episode of Entourage, there's a big storyline over them getting medicinal weed. 
Okay. And they get pulled over by an uncool cop. And Turtle, in a moment of like, similar to what we saw in this movie, like tactical awareness, throws it down a sewer grate. But this prevents, this may prevent them from fucking three girls. Turtle has to fuck what is implied to be the least appealing one. Though, because this was made in 2006, this means she has a normal body weight. <laughs> but he does fuck her. So what, what do we learn from that? But he also got the silver star. He for would have gotten the silver star. Normal body <laughs> yeah, weight. for fucking the woman who doesn't have an exposed rib cage. <laughs> Like, that we know where the planet is. They know where we are. They're, we're fucked. We are fucked in this world. The next movie will be the end of okay, humanity. Matt. Okay, so Matt, Malcolm Matt, Matt. McDowell is on Entourage, not playing himself. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's playing this character who's like supposed to be the greatest manager of all time, which is not really a thing that exists, right? Like, no one would be like, oh, that's the best manager. He's known for being a manager. Yeah, no. Because, There's famous ones, but that's it. Yeah, because E is Vince's manager. Oh, and uh, Martin Landau played Robert Evans. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Yeah, his his catchphrase or his like tick, he would say, would be like, "Is that something you might be interested in?" Like he'd go, "I bought I bought this house for two million dollars, and I'm now it's worth twelve million. Is that something you might be interested in?" That was Peter Berg's Battleship. Right, and that, that we're still on Entourage. 